you so much. Lord, as, as, as we are just intentional here of, of going deep into your word, we keep studying it. We restudy it. We meditate on it. We pray over it. We talk about it. We preach out of your word. This is what we're preaching out of. Not other things. Not other thoughts and philosophies and good ones, bad ones, whatever they are. We want to be in your word. We want to stay in your word. It has life. It's supernatural. It brings change. It brings healing. It brings encouragement and comfort and guidance and admonition. There's so many things that come through your scripture. We love it. We're going deep in it. So bless the message this morning, Lord. Bless it to our ears. Help us to really, really drink deep from this fountain of knowledge. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I was disappointed initially that Joshua only had 24 chapters. And then I realized, wait a minute, God's perfect. So 24 chapters has to be perfect. So we finished our study in Joshua, uh, but it was a rich study. And now we are pressing on. And as I, I announced last week, uh, the messages that we're going to be jumping into are going to be out of First and Second Thessalonians. Right? So we're back in the New Testament. And we know all of Scripture is coordinated. We need to read and study all of Scripture. From Genesis to Revelation and everything in between. We can't overlook this and, and, and just have our favorites here. Man, we got to look into all of Scripture. And over time, we are preaching through so many different aspects of Scripture. And it helps to make everything richer, to see the connections, to have the context. A lot of times it does come to not only what is being instructed or shared, it's having an understanding of the context, right? And so this morning, as we jump into this new study, it's going to be a different type of message because it's going to be an overview of First Thessalonians. It's not just digging in verse by verse as we like to do and we will be doing as we move forward. But this first message is truly an overview of First Thessalonians. It's why I also, in my email this week, was asking all of us, Read through. It's not a long epistle. It's not a long letter. It's five chapters. Read through the whole thing. And then we're going to come back and go over it verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And then you can really dig in even more. But this is a precious epistle. So we're going to look at our back uh, backdrop first. Now, did we already have our map up? Okay. Uh, we're we're going to be going to our map. But here's... Okay. So here's here's the map. Uh, the church, uh, the church was established. This is Paul's second missionary journey, right? This is his second missionary journey, and he leaves from Jerusalem and goes to Damascus, followed the arrow all the way around through Asia, all the way across the straits here. Then he gets up into Greece, Macedonia, and then you can see Thessalonica right there. Do you see Thessalonica right up at the top on the left here? Under the big letters Macedonia for that region? This is the church that Paul helped to establish on his second missionary journey. And we know Paul, as the unbelievable evangelist, was sent out by God. Others were there connected with the church and the Jews in, in Jerusalem and the surrounding area. Paul was commissioned and sent out, and he, he uh, journeyed uh, on, on different trips to different parts of th this part of the world to share the gospel message. Unbelievable evangelist, called to share. He'd just go right into the heart of a community that, where he'd never been before and just connect up with people and start sharing with a boldness, uh, with an accuracy, of course, and it would hit the mark. And it would hit the mark, and the evidence of that was that many came to know Christ, and then church were, churches were planted along the way. And many were up in arms. Many were up in arms. And so when Paul came and established this church because he found people who were receptive to the gospel message, he would stay with them, and he tried to nurture this thing to get it off the ground but oftentimes, and we'll see even in this case, he had to leave rather quickly, and there was tremendous danger 
because Satan was not pleased, people were not pleased who didn't know Christ. And if it challenged their beliefs, if it challenged even their commerce because of things that were shared, they would be up in arms. And so Paul, within a short time, actually had to leave this new church that he just planted. And so what we're going to find in our context here is out of his great concern, out of his great concern for this very young church, he was praying, praying, and he wanted to go back. And it even says in scripture that Satan prevented him from going back, but not too long after, he saw his opportunity and he sent Timothy to go and check on the new church. And we'll read in chapter 3 when we get there that Timothy went to bring tremendous encouragement from Paul, from the Lord, but also from Paul, and to express his love and also then Timothy could spend time there, help them, and then go back to Paul and give a really awesome report about their faithfulness. We'll find that out when we get to chapter 3. But that is our context. On this journey with his evangelism, Paul is also planting churches. And a lot of times he can't stay there. And his heart was actually in so many respects to stay and help nurture, but he had to trust in the Lord. If you gave birth to something and all of a sudden now you need to leave, you can think as a parent, oh my, here's my baby and now I need to be over here. Who's going to look after this? Well, the Lord looks after it, looks after the baby, looks after the young church. But Paul is engaged it's not a hit and run where, hey, come to Christ, see you later, thank you very much, we'll see you in heaven. It's he was loving on these churches. He would continue to write these letters. And this is what we have down to this age to study and understand what the Lord had. So Timothy goes out. Timothy represents Paul. Timothy expresses the love and the encouragement. And then he comes back with this awesome report. This first letter to the Thessalonians, chronologically, is clearly believed by virtually every scholar to be his very first epistle. It's not the first that you find in the New Testament after Acts. It's, it's Romans, but it's the first epistle. It was written approximately in AD 52, and it was written as we understand it, only months after he had established the church and had left, and then Timothy went and he came back, it wasn't written like 10 years later, thinking, what happened to this church and I've lost touch? It was still a very fresh thing, but he wanted to write and provide further encouragement and instruction to them. So what we're going to see is there's a number of really important themes that come out of this first epistle. And the key theme, I would say, of this whole epistle is that Jesus is the source of our hope. Only Jesus. But Jesus is the source of our hope in all things, and he's our source of hope for eternity, for the future, and his future return motivates us to live godly lives. Now, who wrote that, his future return? As soon as I wrote it, I looked at it and said, well, if it's a return, it has to be in the future. So why did you put future in there, Jerry? And I was thinking about that. At that time, people were already, as Jesus had died, was resurrected. He had spent time with the disciples. He descended. There was Pentecost. There's the Holy Spirit now that's in all these believers, and it's growing. But from the very beginning, people were looking for his return looking for his return. And even the writings indicate that there was a sense that there was some imminent aspect to Jesus' return. I remember, for goodness sakes, when our daughter went to college, which is just right across the bay, we're thinking, when will we ever see her again? Well, hopefully next week, because she's right here. But you can only, I mean, this is our daughter. This is the Lord of the universe who has left. And now people are saying, when's he coming back? We have an understanding he's coming back. When is he coming back? And so Paul is going to be sharing about that in this letter and even more in 2 Thessalonians. So we're going to get there in just a little bit. 
But here's how 1 Thessalonians 1.10 reads. Jesus is our hope. The Savior who rescues us from the coming wrath of God. Paul, in his letters, just, it's so deep in theology and understanding of who Christ is and what's going on in the universe as God came to save us through Jesus Christ, redeem us and give us this unbelievable future and he will come back again and he'll be with believers and then they'll be with him until the end of time in eternity in heaven. It's a beautiful picture and Paul has this great understanding that he shares with the church. But there's other themes that we're going to come across and we're going to dig into into in this chapter in, in these five chapters. The first chapter, I really love it because as he's starting off the letter that he's sending to the church, he is expressing his thankfulness to this church that he had planted. Look at 1 Thessalonians 1, 2. Well, let's start with verse 1. Paul, Silas, and Timothy are effectively the ones who are writing this letter, but it's Paul with them to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you. I love the way he starts letters. You'll see I love the way he closes letters right out of the gate. It's affirming, encouraging, awesome, profound, infinite wisdom. Grace and peace to you. And then he goes on in verse 2. We always, I love always, Thank God for all of you. It's not we sometimes thank God for a couple of you. We always thank God for all of you. He's writing to the church. Mentioning you in our prayers. We talk to the Lord about you all the time. We continually remember before our God. We, we think and remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. We continually remember these things before our God and Father, your work produced by faith. This is a young church, but they are doing works produced by faith. Your labor prompted by what? Love. The love of God prompts us to serve and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Even for a young church, Paul was under attack and had to leave. You can only imagine the church is going to come under attack too. And our churches have always throughout history come under attack because Satan is furious. He doesn't want anybody to know Christ. He's here to kill, destroy, steal, do everything other than what God would be promoting. And unfortunately, men, women, in our flesh will be victims to that and also complicit with that until we come and know Jesus Christ and follow him as Lord and Savior and do the will of the Father. So this church was under attack and he's already commending them for their endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. But this first chapter, there's it's precious. He's 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 offering up his thankfulness. It's so important for us to be thankful to, to the Lord for so many things. I thank the Lord for you every week. You, all of you, not some of you, all of you. We are precious unto the Lord. We need to offer up thanks merely for the fact that God has created each of us as unique human beings to serve him. And we have the privilege of doing it together. So this thankfulness has to be there. And it just emanates from Paul. It just emanates from him right away. You can only imagine the church when he left. Ah! And now he's writing this letter to them. And it's right out of the gates of grace and peace to you. And we pray for you. We thank the Lord for you and specifically for all these awesome things. Wow. Do you know how important it is for God to affirm us? Do you know how important affirmation is in your life? 
when someone affirms you in something that's in the Lord, it's important. You need to pay attention. You don't need to look past it. Say, wow, that's an affirmation. I see the Lord affirming so many things in this season for this church. And it just keeps getting affirmed in extraordinary ways. But that expression of affirmation, you want to see a child grow? Guide them and affirm them and encourage them on the right path. Never affirm anybody on the wrong path. That doesn't help. Express love and support. But affirmation every day. And he's probably getting tired of it. James will hear me say, I love you. I am so proud of you. And I kiss him. He's 14. He's looking at me like, okay. Every day, every morning when he wakes up and then we pray together and every night before he goes to bed. And I don't know how many times in between. But there is a thankfulness before the Lord that I have for, of course, my wife, of course, my daughter, and of course, my son. And I'm talking right now about my son because every day this is the pattern. I have the opportunity to express love and support for him and encouragement and guidance. And that's what Paul is doing right out of the gate to this church. This is how we also need to operate every day, every day. Now, the second chapter, we, when we come to the second chapter, we find out a little bit more about Paul's pastoral heart and his concern for the Thessalonians. So we'll be digging into that when we really dissect chapter 2. But as a pastor, not the Apostle Paul, but as a, just a pastor who's responsible for leading and shepherding, oh my goodness, this just speaks to me and is such a great model his concerns and and what he's sharing with those who he loves, who he wants to see really grow and be on that great path. And he's hearing really great reports, but he also wants to encourage them even more. And he does share his concerns with them. You hear and read about his heart in chapter two. So let me just touch on these verses, uh, which are verses eight to 12. Okay, here's what he writes in chapter 2, verses 8 to 12. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. We're connected with you. We love you. We want to share our lives with you because you had become so dear to us. Wow. Surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship. We work night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel of God to you. Here's our heart for you. We're going to work night and day. We're not going to begrudge it. We're going to do it willingly, but we want you to know it. This is so important. We love you so much. We're going to throw ourselves at this community and at this relationship and do everything we can when we're with you and do everything we can when we're away to support you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Beautiful is this man's heart before the Lord for these people he has not known a lifetime and he's not related to by blood who he's come into their life. They responded to the gospel and it doesn't take 30 years when you get connected in Christ to fall in love in Jesus Christ with your brother or sister. It happens like right away. It happens right away. It's so awesome. I love this. And and his heart. So we press on into chapter 3, and we'll get into that. And that's where he is actually, uh, you know, sending out Timothy and getting the report back from Timothy. We already touched on that. So we will get into that when we get to chapter 3. In chapter 4, he goes on to provide some instruction that really is admonition really admonition for holy living. It's really important to the Lord that we lead holy lives. He came to save us because we're sinners and we make mistakes and we're not perfect, 
But now he wants us to go on and keep growing up into leading holy lives, honoring him more and more and more, and to continue working on that, to continue working on that. Um, someone contacted me this week, and I was so thankful. They said, hey, I'm kind of, I'm struggling with this. It's a logistical thing, and it has to do with the ministry here. At first, I was so thankful. Thanks for calling. Thanks for calling. They were looking for encouragement, but counsel, prayer support. And they just had this great and awesome heart to say, hey, I, I want this to all, it's not about me. I want this always to be about the Lord. And I, the Lord's still working with me on that. I can respond in my flesh. I can respond even in anger or frustration if somebody does something differently the way that I would do it. But I don't want to. And the Lord's really worked with me in my life to address that. And I do operate differently now. But there's still this temptation to operate in the flesh. And what a great understanding. What an awesome thing to be talking to me about where I could just affirm and encourage because first of all, this person is just amazing in the Lord, just amazing. Her testimony is just, I, I just, and I shared that with her as an affirmation how important she is, not just to the Lord, but to all of us. And thanks for having the maturity to come instead of exacerbating a problem or, or just trying to process it in a different way. It's coming, Lord, what are you doing here? And how am I challenged? Why am I challenged? What can I do about this? And then also for the sake of the church, how do we resolve this in the most effective way? That's a godly way of responding to something that's a frustration that's happened to you in life or in ministry. To seek counsel, to seek prayers, to bounce it off of somebody you trust who can also share a Christ-centered perspective with you. But someone who maybe doesn't have a biased view, because you're in this thing. So the person outside can say, oh, I get, I see that. And I see this. And look what the Lord is doing. And look how beautiful it is when we come at it this way and we then resolve it. And then we move forward. There's a victory. It happens. It happens all the time. It doesn't have to. I can stay over here and be pretty frustrated and upset and bothered. And so can you. I'm talking to everybody. But, but, but look at the beauty of how God resolves it when we take it to him and we get assistance from one another. So Paul is there to provide this kind of admonition towards holy living unto the Lord, process things in a healthy way. And that's in First, uh, that's in, uh, first Thessalonians chapter 4. And I'm just going to read the first verse this morning. We'll get into the study when we get there. But it says, finally, brothers, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. So he's affirming them while he's encouraging them. We instructed you about this, to live unto the Lord, a life that's pleasing unto the Lord. And in fact, you are doing this. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. I love that, because whatever you're doing, whatever I'm doing, if it's a good thing, the Lord says, that's a good thing. I'm pleased with that. I'm blessed with that. Others are touched by that. Others are changed by that even. But do it more and more. Do it more and more. How bad if I lived every day just fully in this place of grace and trust and empathy and compassion and understanding what's right and wrong and just living it out perfectly. Bring that on more and more. Ain't there yet. But we're on a trajectory. We're moving in that direction, and we're going to talk about that when we get to chapter 4. So he's instructing, but he's also affirming appropriately and encouraging. It's really special. When we get to the end of chapter 4, oh boy, now we're talking about what's going to be happening as we look forward to the return of Christ. And even before the return of Christ, what's referred to uh, affectionately by many as the rapture. So let's read this verse. This is 1 Thessalonians, it's three verses, 4, 16 to 18. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. Wow. 
and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. That's a cool scene. Include me on that one, Lord. There's a prayer. Include all of us in that moment, in that, oh, come on. It's outstanding what God has planned and what he's fulfilling and he's leading up to and how we can look forward to it. This is written 2,000 years ago almost. And Paul's writing then about these things that God had shared with him as about how this is going to transpire. And it's to give them a glimpse of the future and hope truly for what Christ will will, will be doing. And it's not like, I'm pretty sure he's going to come back. i got a good feeling about that. It is specific, and he's coming back, and here's even some details, not the full story, but enough details for you to know, wow, get your mind around this. This is awesome and powerful and to look forward to. So what does he say then at the very, very end of verse 18? Therefore, Encourage one another with these words. Because the Lord's coming back. Because of all of this is in front of us. Let alone God covering our sins behind us. Look what's in front of us. Wow. So encourage one another. Use that as a motivation to live a godly life. And to look forward to Christ coming back. 2,000 years ago. What's the benefit in sharing 2,000 years ago that God will be coming back? Maybe he doesn't say it, but in the future, the future return. I'm going to repeat that. Anyway, he's going to return at an appointed time, but it's not actually in their lifetimes. It still has tremendous value to provide hope and encouragement and knowledge and motivation. Motivation. To keep living unto the Lord and live godly lives. I love this. You're going to find a lot of encouragement throughout all of Scripture. You're going to find a lot of encouragement in our study of 1 Thessalonians for sure. So that's our overview. That's our context. And I trust as we have this context now of the church being planted through Paul and Timothy going to check in and coming back with a faithful report so that Paul is even more informed. So when he writes the letter, it's even more specific with God's wisdom as to what they're processing, what challenges they're facing, and how he can help them. How he can help them by sending his love and his support and in further instruction and also to offer up that hope based in the reality of Christ coming again. So we're entering into another very rich study here. Let's pray. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for Paul and his faithfulness to serve you. It's remarkable, his boldness in evangelism, but we also learn about his knowledge that you shared with him that's expressed in all these letters, and we're in 1 Thessalonians. The context is rich. It's real. It's replete with challenges that he's responding to in the church at that time, but also marvelous things where people are sowing in, prompted by love to serve and to help and to be faithful, even to to get through and endure the challenges that they're facing. This is a great model for us and a great inspiration. Thank you for what you're sharing in this letter for them, for us, and all in these last 2,000 years about your return. We look forward to it. We are so excited by it, Lord. We know you have a future for us, which is incredibly beautiful. So help that to inspire us to godly living this day, this week, and for the rest of our lives. We love you, and we thank you for your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.